So as you can see, our population is dropping off a little bit, which is fine. Um, after 15 of these workshops, it gets a little long. Um, so we, we have two more hours, and we're going to like take it as long as it needs to go. And if we get done, we get done. Um, so there's no reason we have to keep this going until 3. And we really have um, three things to get through at this point. The technical principles, the non-technical principles, and the what's next for law.gov. And so we're going to let Tom Bruce, with a degree in theater, and the technical principles. Um, I'll do the legal principles with my degree in economics. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So, so nobody up here knows what, they were, what they're doing, and the vast majority of people have wisely chosen to take their bag lunch and leave. <laughs> so let's talk about, uh, it, well, you will recall that Carl mentioned this morning that at the core of the document that he is going to write and circulate as, as the quote-unquote report on this effort, um, there will be 10 principles, five of them technical, five of them, as I would say, uh, more, more policy oriented. Uh, I'm leading off with the, with the boring ones, uh, which are the five technical principles. But I think we already know uh, from this morning's discussion that even technical principles, as dry as they may seem, very quickly shade over into policy in this world. Uh, and sometimes they can be useful ways to disguise the fact that we're making policy prescriptions. <laughs> but in any case, they're, they're, they're a little juicier than they initially appear. And Carl has, Carl has proposed five that I will just throw out here in a list uh, in a very summary form, and we can then take them one by one. Uh, those are availability via bulk access, authentication of access and access methods and documents, availability of historical archives, development and use of interoperability standards, and vendor and media neutral citation. Uh, none of these, I suspect, are particularly new to most of you, but we'll look at them in detail shortly. What I would like to do and to discuss over the next 45 minutes um, are a number of questions about them, right? So first of all, have we covered with those five principles everything that we think is important? Um, is anything missing? Uh, are there things that should go in the supporting material that is developed to surround this, some of which I suspect will emerge from this discussion? Uh, some things that I thought of that, that just on the face of it I would, I would want to see along with bold statements about these is to, are, are some thinking about whether there's differential treatment of any of these or when we're talking about case law statutes and regs. Some of them seemed to me more or less applicable to one or, or the other of those. Uh, what a standards development process, or perhaps more accurately, lack of process, um, might actually look like when we're talking about standards, um, you know, sort of hit the low hanging fruit first. Do we at some point want to bring in an explicit discussion of costs as being either sort of implied or alleviated uh, by any of these? Um, I, I have to say, I will, I will tip my hand a bit here, and I, I don't want to start World War III over this just yet, uh, that my, the, the principal thing that's driving me on the cost issue is actually the question surrounding authentication. Uh, because I think that, frankly, most of the schemes uh, that I've seen put forward so far don't necessarily play well uh, against, for example, historical archives uh, when we start talking about what the costs actually are of, of doing it. So, that said, uh, let us look at, actually, you know what I should do? I should go back. I do that? Oh, that blanks in this, uh, this particular software. Uh, I should go back to just that, the list of five and start by asking, is there anything else by way of a technical principle that anyone thinks should be on this list? So again, we have availability of stuff by bulk access, authentication, the idea that we need historical archives to the extent possible, interoperability, and uh, citation, which is in some ways a specialized form of interoperability, but everybody would laugh at us if it wasn't there. Okay. Um, do privacy concerns go in either of those, of the technical or the non-technical categories? Yeah, non-tech, there is an um, active program of R&D with a specific call out for we need much better privacy tools. Because somehow that seems like a very technical problem to me. Yeah. Rather than, you know. Well, the problem is that the solution is highly technical. 
Yeah, there's no decent tools out there to do privacy is one of the big roadblocks. What about that program that they just ran on my computer last week that pulled out, that made a list of every social security number or miswritten phone number that had not enough digits in it? Uh, because that was like Adobe Acrobat Pro? Not, no, it was some other bizarre thing that, that the university was doing to all of us for their... Uh, at, at the level of 10 and 20 million page archives, I have yet to find a decent open source okay. solution that, that effectively does not only social security numbers, but does the more heuristic things like names of minor children. Yeah, it looked, so it looked for passwords and passwords. But it will definitely be mentioned. It's definitely one yeah. of the issues. Privacy has to be in there. Yeah, Canadians have done a little work on this area. Yeah. In this area, it goes well on, on sort of prospective stuff. Uh, the, the expense is always, the cost model changes considerably when you look retrospectively at your library. So I, I have one, uh, and again, uh, you have a, a semi-glossed version, uh, since I've seen the slide deck already, yeah. that goes in a little more depth. But um, when you say available via bulk access, um, the crowd at places like Sunlight Foundation would say, we also need notification mechanisms. We need to know what's new. Um, it has to be easy, either through a mechanism like Adam RSS, or even just simply a directory listing to know what's been added to the bulk archive. Right, so some form of some form of current awareness, automated current awareness service is, is, is certainly a piece of this. Yeah. Uh, I suspect that actually there will be many of those, not only around specific technical standards, uh, but also around different user communities. For example, I mean, I, I, Carl's heard me on this subject many times. I, I've yapped for years about hooking the AI PMH uh, up to judicial decisions. You know, having, having some form of a metadata harvest available for judicial makes perfect sense to me as a way of running federated collection. You know, so there's all sorts of notification functions around the idea of federating these things uh, that I think fall under that, that also do service as, as current awareness services. Yes? Under, again, the subcategory, I may mean, already be there. We were talking about the dates of things yesterday and how people don't date things. And right. that, to me, is, I don't know that it's under new citation. But so interoperability standards has actually got a comma, if you look at his gloss. And that says, such as metadata standards, document IDs, and, and I believe the, the date problem the date is, problem is a metadata. Yeah. Yeah. They're thoroughly treated under metadata, I think. Okay. Oh, perhaps too thoroughly. <laughs> uh, the key metadata issues is jurisdiction and date. Um, uh, anything else in the might be missing? Anything anybody sees that shouldn't be there? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I was just. I, I, I certainly understand the argument that says develop these interoperability standards, but it, it seems to me that I mean, you have to have at least some, even if there is an agreement on the metadata yet, you have to start with metadata. You get the availability should imply. That the, I say DTDs as if it's an XML, but you know something. The, the description of what's in there, right? Because there's lots of things you can get bulk access to, but then you have to decode what the, the code fields are. I mean, this happened with the patent database, where you get the field of the patent, and it's you have to spend 35 bucks to the patent office to get a faxed version of what that code means, and it can take you a month. I mean, we try this, and they they keep. I mean, eventually it's been, it's been open source now, but it's that kind of thing where even when they make it available, if, if there's no decoding ring. And I don't want to necessarily push off as a subpoint that we're going to agree on standards later. Well, remember there's three, three levels to this. There is the high level declaration of principles. And the question is rather than say interoperability standards, should we maybe say interoperability standards, comma, including metadata and document IDs. The next level down is the FAQ. Like, what the hell do you mean by, you know, yeah, metadata? I guess I, guess I just wouldn't define it. I would have said availability of documented, you know, I, I wouldn't put it at, and I think of this as a core principle of making data available, is that, that when you make data available, part of the availability is availability of documents and their, the descriptions, you know, the, the, the keys and the tables. Okay. Standards is another thing that's important, but I don't think, I mean, I think of that as, the meta, you know, the what we would say metadata, but they might not understand is metadata. Is, is okay. you know, well, I, I think yeah, point taken. It's a question is, of flipping an emphasis, and, and we hear you. It is absolutely the case that most metadata projects that I know of in any discipline suffer from horrible under documentation. I mean, there, there's there's a sort of belief in the technical community that, that if you throw the scheme up there, you throw the DTD up there, well, then everybody understands what the hell you're talking about. And of course. <coughs> That's not the case. I mean, and, and I think we can sort of assume, uh, I hope we can assume, uh, that what we're talking about here are high quality efforts <laughs> and, 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 and not bad ones. Uh, 
I understand exactly what you're saying. But I'd rather have a bad one than nothing. I think what Tom and I are, are dealing with is the issue is we've dealt with so many bad, uncoordinated metadata that, that, you know, part of the message we're trying to get across is you need to do good metadata. Um, and, but I, I think it's a wordsmithing issue. And, and we hear your point very much that, that you want to hear, you know, that the, that the documents are important, but the documents without the metadata. And I, I'm assuming the librarians will agree with that point. But, but you know, the, the point that you're, 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 you're making here, uh, in, indirectly, and it's an important one, is that part of the gloss for this uh, really should be use cases. Yes. And those use cases should be as far as, well, I, I, I'm sort of mean, but the, the, the use cases should, as far as possible, stand in contrast to the behavior of existing systems. Right, so for example, a classic example, the sort of thing you're talking about is what happens when the, the poor private citizen uh, confront something like regulations.gov that basically requires them to know which agency is regulating the thing that they are interested in before they can find any information about what's being regulated. It's classic metadata failure, right? Uh, so as I say, use cases that sort of stand in contrast to what's going on with deficient existing systems, I think, are an important pieces. I, I think in some ways that's really what you're saying. Yeah, so, yeah, what does the poor son of a bitch do when he's looking at this? So one of the questions yeah. I think you should ask yourself is, if we come up with these 10 buckets, could you write a document that, that explains this particularly important fact? Because what we're hoping is that we're going to get the statement of principles, with the FAQ suitable for deans and law school members, but there, there, there's going to be a whole bunch of other glosses out there digging real deep into some of these things and saying, let me explain in great detail about the metadata problem having to do with the following domains of application and why it's done right and why it's done wrong. And what we're looking for is that high-level vocabulary that everybody can agree on that says the 10 categories of things that are important. Yeah. Joe, Joe Calandrino at Princeton had a series of posts on Freedom to Tinker, which you know, used to be at mm -hmm. one, not longer, on, on this sort of thing, on sort of good practices in government, mm -hmm. uh, exposing the data and, and ways to do it. So I think there's, there's a lot of work there that he and some mm -hmm. of Yeah. But the big question for you is when you look at these principles, is it something that you can look at and say, I wish to explain point number three in greater detail, as opposed to, I believe these 10 points are all screwed up, and here's my 10 points, right? What we're trying to see is can we get everybody to say that the 10 key principles are these, well, let me explain the one I really care about, and its subtleties, and why it's actually more complicated than just one sentence. And yeah, in that respect, as in many others, I, I had to restrain, Carl sent me some language on these yesterday, and I kind of had to restrain myself because uh, I realized partway through reading them that they really need to be a little bit of a Rorschach test for the person who's, who's uh, for, for, for the ultimate viewer, right? I mean, we, we want things that can, the, the consensus can actually develop around. So they, they don't want to invite any more logic chopping than they, than, than, than they have to, right? And so in that sense, they'll be a little bit vague, they'll be a little bit aspirational. Uh, you know, they want to be focused. They don't want to be, you know, mom, apple pie, and you know, that, that sort of stuff. But on the other hand, they do want to leave a little bit of room for people to see in them, uh, perhaps a little bit of what they want. Authentication is a great example of that one. We should have authentication. Don't want much more than that in the principles. You know. <laughs> well, and a lot of people don't understand authentication. I had a really enlightening discussion with my dean about that work. He had no clue, and then all of a sudden he realized, oh my god, all the university regs are posted on the web in a totally insecure way that uh, could be, you know, some, somebody like me could do bad things to that. Yeah. <laughs> But we don't want in the principles to have the discussion of the <coughs> DNA, for example, on whether you should be able to point to any three words and know that they're authentic. Because there's no consensus around that principle. I, 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 I can, I'll bet you can get consensus around what it would cost, though. <laughs> uh, so, taking these in, I mean, we've been, we've been jumping around and that's inevitable and we'll continue, but let's let's take a look at, at, at number one here, availability for, uh, via bulk access. Uh, as written, uh, primary legal materials should be made available for bulk access. Current awareness mechanisms should be built so that data consumers may know when new materials are added. Uh, I note that we do not say XML in there, although we are probably implying it. I mean, what else would you use? PDF? Well, I mean, PDF is a fact of life. Um, you know, I, 
the bulk access principle basically says I don't care if you got WordPerfect and WordStar files, you just need to make them available to us. Mm -hmm. right? And that's principle number one, is, is what you got, you got to be able to get it without having to write a web crawler that changes every two days because you changed your underlying code or having to go through a search engine that doesn't have permanent URLs to figure out what, what's there. I mean, that, that's that kind of core key principle and that differentiates it from the, gee, if you put up a website and I've already got keyword searching, why do you even need my data because I made it available to the public. So we need somebody to generate ultimately a sort of a what bulk access is and is not piece. Yeah, and I think that, that again is a glossy thing. Maybe in the FAQ yeah. um, there are currently mechanisms available such as FTP and RSync at a technical level. And then the core point being that you shouldn't have to be a rocket scientist to write a program into some proprietary website. Now how you explain that to a dean, I don't know. but. But, but it's all about repurposing for other people building websites, not just us. Yes? So what's not in here that we talked about yesterday is various versions of things. I mean, to be honest, what is primary legal material when it comes to the law? What was common in 1995 is 2005. Well, that, and do we describe yeah. that? I don't know what I want, to be honest. Right. It's just. So that's principle three was availability of historical archives. Does that cover that? Yeah, it, maybe it needs to go under there. You know, what are we archiving at different stages? Right. Okay. So that that's a gloss on availability of historical archives. And yeah. That, that's where well, it I states. I think we need to flush that out because I think most people think it's current and on the internet, and that's fine. And well, I mean, the FAQ, for example, might talk about how the Code of Federal Regulations is interesting. On the other hand, when you sue somebody, it's over a violation of the law at some point in time, and you need previous versions of the CFR. Let, let, me, let me ask my, my library friends in the room who have done time on collection development activities and acquisitions groups and that sort of thing, a, a, a pragmatic question. Something you were saying this morning, Carl, about the, the, the and we'll say again, I suspect, in, in, in a few minutes, about what, what is primary legal material when we need to say that, and, and things about this archiving issue. Uh, lead me to this sort of much larger question of, never mind that we all know that it's very hard to set a, 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 a discrete limit on, on where this thing stops. Mm -hmm. How do we avoid entangling ourselves in endless discussions about where it should stop at the point where we're trying to enunciate these principles. This is why I'm asking those of you who have been on collection development committees, <laughs> because I assume you must know how to do this, right? I mean, how, how, how do you do that? How do we set up a process where we don't get involved in endless wrangling over what is and isn't, what should be in, what should be out, et cetera, et cetera? I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge. I think it's up to the individual jurisdictions to be determining that, right? And don't you do it next way? You just start with the big stuff and go until you run out of steam or energy or whatever. <laughs> or money. Yeah. Or whichever comes first. I mean, do you like the way I defined it, which said at, at the top we know what this means, mm -hmm. and as we get lower, you're going to have to adapt your, your definitions. I, 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 don't have, I don't have a problem with the way you stated it. I would add one sentence. Please don't wire us on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, I think you need that level of ambiguity in the sense. Yeah. You know, and that having it the way he has it, you're, I don't think you're opening, you're, I don't think the venues you're bringing this into that you're necessarily going to open yourself up to that same kind of. That's what well, we got out of Colorado, the chair yeah. of the Judiciary Committee was, oh my God, you got to be nuts putting all the historical archives for every county up, that's just not going to be possible. Um, and I was like, well, you know, uh, it's you know big, agree, it, it, it'd yeah. be hard. It's, it's an aspirational goal to strive towards. Uh, if you pick it too detailed, then drive people away, so I think the way you have it worded kind of is specific enough and it leaves it open enough to bring to whatever point is appropriate for whatever jurisdiction. I will get immediate feedback on this from the Ninth Circuit because in my cover letter to them in my submission materials, um, I defined what I meant by primary legal materials and I said this certainly means Supreme Court. This certainly me. I used the word certainly three times, and I know some judge is going to be like cutting me off in two seconds for using the word certainly. So we'll get some feedback on that slippery slope argument. I think it's analogous almost to the copyright issue in terms of like you know that it's yeah, that's and so. the quote, the newer quote there about how it's you know basically no codes and 
statutes and then there are all these other more gray areas. You know, so as long as you've, def which I think you kind of did in a sense, defined what it's definitely covering, yeah. the rest of it is going to work itself yeah, out. Yeah, Law Dot Gov is a shining city on the hill. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, my answer on the county one would be, the librarian, what's most requested should be converted. You know, uh, not, not necessarily everything today, mm -hmm. but Okay, so maybe under the availability of historical archives, um, we certainly note previous versions, and in the FAQ, maybe we note the principle of, of most needed yeah. materials or citizen requests. Or so, anything further on bulk access before I hit the space bar and make this slide go away forever? <laughs> okay. Can you do that with authentication too? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could make it go away. Uh, well, I mean, you could make it go away, but then everything you do will be a very limited usage. Michelle yesterday was complaining about the disclaimer on the Mass General Laws, but I think that's an essential disclaimer oh, yeah. because they're not yeah. authentic and authenticatable or dated even for that. No, hey, we buy into the authentic, believe me, we no. buy into authentication. <laughs> no, I, I don't, uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. I, I, I absolutely understand the need for authentic. And I, I think it's I, I think it's a fine idea. Um, but I think this is the one that needs a lot of explanation. Like, yeah, I mean, my dean was like, he didn't believe, he couldn't believe at all that it was an issue. And then when I pointed out what the issue was, he was like, oh my god, that issue is in a lot more places than we thought. We should pay more attention to web security, to um, sources of stuff on the web. Um, so for documents should be authenticated, can, can we do that by example? So in the FAQ, maybe it says, for example, the Code of Federal Regulations produces XML source code, and there's also a PDF reference copy which has a digital signature on it so that anyone looking at some language that purports to be from the Federal Register can go back to this document, verify the signature, and verify the language. The point that is that I sufficient? I think so. I mean, it, it makes implicitly a point that I would love to see made explicitly is that there are different forms of authentication or different authentication regimes that are appropriate to different types of end user activity. Now, so often what has come out of, of the library community on this issue has been premised on a background assumption that people are involved in high stakes litigation or, or, or some other sort of highly aggravated setting. Uh, whereas in fact, a lot of people are simply doing it check with this stuff of, of, of some kind or other. They're online doing something that I guess I would call legal risk management. Uh, and to drive up costs for that audience, uh, it makes, makes very little sense to me. The, 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 the analogy I often use is, is, is that there's, sitting in, in, in Paris, there's a piece of platinum that we know that it is exactly one meter long. Uh, and if I am hanging a picture in my living room and want to center it on the wall, it is very seldom that I go to Paris to check my tape measure against that bar of platinum. Right. This is not, not a high stakes measurement activity. Right? In that direction, maybe instead of saying authenticated, it should say authenticate a bulb. Ah. I like that. I do too. I do too. I would change it on the slide if I knew how. <laughs> <laughs> what program are you? I'm, I'm using Keynote, actually. Okay. Uh, I'm, not, not to, yeah. I'm not that <laughs> adept. Uh, no, it's, this, is, this, is purely, this is purely operator. <laughs> the program. It has other difficulties with that. No and for access mechanisms, I thought the FAQ would explain why when you go to a banking site, you're using secure HTTP, and if you're going to the Supreme Court, you probably ought to get that same level of trust as Citibank. Uh, I mean, there's, there's scarce more to say about this. Are we going to say any of it now, or should I just uh, hit, hit that space bar and make Carl happy? Uh, I think at the principal level, I'm, I'm, uh, authenticatable, I think, is a great Yeah, I great mean, tweet. if you want more input, the um, double A double L, the I can't understand yeah. anymore. But, um, in, in my report, I will be spending at least 10 pages going through the existing studies on authentication, right. best practices on the internet, and citing all sorts of sources. Um, there will be a lot of footnotes in that section. And maybe even some math. <laughs> <laughs> So, historical archives, uh, laws based on precedent to the extent possible, which I take to be a non uh, complete historical archives should be made available to 
says, for example, the CFR, previous versions of codes are important, same with statutes and things. Um, and needless to say, this costs money. One should probably put the, the high demand things up <coughs> first if one has to prioritize. And, and then to the extent, you, if you could mention dates in here someplace, I don't know how. See, something about effective dates, not just yeah. versions, but yeah, effective dates point. or, you know, to the extent capturable, whatever. Yeah, Got it. So that's a metadata thing, though, isn't it? Uh, no? Yeah, although when we start talking about the archive, that really brings very clearly for me the issue uh, that was raised earlier about, uh, about sort of having appropriate cataloging data. Yeah, on okay, the site. okay. Uh, I, I can see that as an FAQ, that, that in putting up the archives, it should be clearly stated what the effective dates are of, of the different versions. What you don't want somebody doing is going into an old version and thinking that's the current law. That's bad, and you don't want somebody researching the law in 498 and pulling up the current version, and that needs to be clearly demarked. Um, yeah. Footnote, see metadata. <laughs> and then they Cataloging, start, labeling. You know. Then you start tiptoeing sort of quietly into things like records retention policy, right? I mean, it, 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 I think it would be helpful as we write the glosses on this policy to, to look at all of these from the standpoint of somebody who has a little guy sitting on his shoulder saying, what's this going to cost me? What's this going to cost me? What's this going to cost me? Uh, which in this case translates to, how long do I have to keep this stuff? How long do I have to keep this stuff? How long do I have to keep it? Um, and you know, the further you move into comparable materials, the, 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 the bigger question that becomes. You know, are, you, are, are you really going to keep every driver's license out? State of New Hampshire going back to the invention of the Model T, probably not, or at least not at all. Speaking technically <coughs> and stuff, do places like Massachusetts where we have it where it's all databases and dynamically generated web pages, does that make additional problems and do we need to address it or is that just their problem? Well that's a bulk access issue, isn't okay. it? I mean it's not available for bulk access if it's buried in a database and I can't grab it. I don't care if it's in a database as long as it's I can get it out. To the database. Yeah. I don't care where you keep it as long as I can somehow crawl it and, and pull it. Do we want to make explicit mention that the historical archive is as governed by the bulk access principle as prospective? Sure. I think you on point three, see bulk access. Anything more on historics? Yes. Back to what you were saying on the driver's license. I mean, we have in the court system records management. We do know what we're going to keep or not keep. I mean, some things we pull every tenth case or whatever. So there's a part of me is not here, but lower down. Do we want to honor local record? Policies. I mean, if people learn how to poll, I mean, they've already made their policies. So yeah, a way to win people over is to say, we understand. Yes. This well, may I'm not. Sure. Here's the problem: that we are going to keep it involved. We already know that we're pulling every tenth case in probate and family to keep for archival purposes. We're not going to keep nine. Law.gov is not about making the principles here, it's about saying you should have principles. Right. And you know, a general principle is if it is primary legal materials, archives should be complete, but if it is your local policy that your archive is complete after throwing away everything more than 30 days old, well that that is you know and, a and duly aren't primary, these are more the subcategories that go under primary. Yeah. And I guess one of the things I'm thinking too, and this is this is more even more applicable to, to the, the slide on interoperability that's coming up, is that even if the entire you know federal judiciary lines up on the steps of the Supreme Court and tells Carl to go climb a rope, <laughs> I, I, I I would hope that the enunciation of these principles would spawn a certain amount of discussion in the professional subcommunities like the court library about what best practices are in light of these principles, right? Uh, because I do think that on the one hand, 
yes, it probably means wholesale adoption of stuff that's already out there that, that, that's sensible, and it may also mean re-examination of some stuff that's out there that's not, uh, in, in, in terms of what people are doing as matters of group yeah. uh, Because once you start looking at this stuff, it's always seemed to me that once you start looking through the, the, this stuff at the, at this stuff through the lens of broad public access, then what you decide you want to do about how you handle it changes rather drastically from what it would be if it was just sitting in a law library being used by lawyers. It's my own bizarre take on it. Uh, standards and interoperability. Uh, technical standards for document structure, document identifiers, metadata, and other aspects of document structure and format should be developed and applied as extensively as possible, consistent with standards under development. So maybe instead of the short version, maybe that's a longer version um, that is what actually goes into principles? Uh, maybe. Um, there's a couple of things. I, I have some points of nervousness about this, and I'm the one who expanded the language. Okay. Uh, my first point of nervousness is that I think we have to be very, very careful in this, particularly with respect to document structure. Not to be doing anything that could remotely in a thousand billion million years be interpreted by a judge as saying, we're going to tell you how to write. Because the, the amount of sensitivity on that point is just unbelievable. Um, same thing is true of metadata when you get to, well, let me make an ethnographic observation. Uh, the whole time that we've been working with federal agencies on, on, on regulatory stuff, which I have been in various guises for the last three or four years, I've been astonished by the extent to which government lawyers confuse the labeling of a pro the standardization of labels for a process with the standardization of a process. And what I mean is this. If you told these guys that for reasons of, I don't know, a great bulk deal, everyone in the government tomorrow would be required to use green telephones. Three quarters of them would assume that you were telling them what they could say on the telephones. That actually happened in Congress when they gave them permission to tweet. Um, but you, you, had to get, um, you had to get clearance from Committee on House Administration before using a new technology, right? Um, and so they said, you can use social media, but you have to let us know which ones you're going to use. And a whole bunch of people seized on that as, as Pelosi wants to check my blog before I'm able to publish anything. Um, now my worry about that one is that they accept our offer and they say, that's great, we do need standards, we accept your entire offer, and please come back in 10 years and we'll have the standards done. Right? We're not going to do anything until then. Um, so that, that's my worry yeah. on, on, on that point, is that, they, that people look at it and say, well, good, we need to like, get every, every court in the United States together to all agree on what the standards are. And when we do that, we'll begin making the data available. I mean, could you say move towards technical standards? In other words, put up what you got or what you can put up, and we'll work around it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these sound like FAQ things. Um, so, well, okay. Although, well, no, actually, one might, you know, one might lawyer this a little bit, or wordsmith it a little bit by saying, uh, for example, other aspects of document structure and format should be developed and progressively or prospectively okay. applied as, uh, as extensively as possible. Right? I mean, something in there that indicates that you're, you're not going to stop the you know, the party, the music's not going to stop while all this is going on. It's like authentication is not an answer, it's an ongoing commitment to a process. And, and the same thing with these document structure things is you should get better today and then you should keep on getting better and this isn't going to be a one-time thing. Uh, there clearly needs to be an FAQ thing about the local authority to like decide what it is you need to do. You know, appropriate caveat about let's not have too much exceptionalism. Not too much exceptionalism, yeah. not too much centralization. Yeah. I mean, there really but is. It's still up to each jurisdiction to really, you know, within the framework of its legal framework to decide what it is it's going to apply. There's, there's a Goldilocks problem here, sort of knowing what's just right. Yes. Um, two things. One, I don't know if you can flip it, but would it would it be worth to do interoperability in standards? I mean, is our first goal really that things can interact? Yes. Operate? Yeah, right. And that may take some emphasis off of Excellent. the first thing I, you want to get done is the standard. Maybe we want to just flip it. Then my second thing. My sense is for the little municipal governments, I should probably call them little municipal governments, I think people would love to have guidelines even today. You know, why are we having every municipal person sit around and figure out what to do? Um, so standards may be too strong a word. This may be fine for standards, but in, in describing it, 
at some point, I would say, at least minimally, can you just do this, this, and this? Because we don't want, there's 361 towns in Massachusetts. Why are they all sitting around and trying to solve this problem? I agree with you. Don't say you solve it this way. But even to say, here are three options. Why do you think what's best for you? And get us moving. Tom has a level one, level two way, and this is a standard computer science thing. Whenever you come in for a feature and we're developing software, that's a wonderful idea. We're going to put it in version two. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, there, there, are, there is obviously a sort of progressive way in which one can address the standardization process, not just because, you know, pretty much anybody can look at a judicial opinion and say, okay, I can identify 10 things I need to, I need to know about this thing. Um, and you can do all that without having to get bogged down in actually somewhat more interesting questions like, oh, well, how am I going to use metadata to represent the procedural posture of this case? Because you really would like to do that. It's just that you're not going to do it by next Tuesday. And, and there's a certain amount of stuff that you want to do by next Tuesday. Yeah. Um, I, you know, another, another sort of surrounding materials thing on this. I don't think you can really do interoperability standards. And I'm thinking about your 300 some odd towns now. Uh, without nodding to some rather specific notion of trying to do public education on this, or, 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 or professional education on this, right? Uh, I mean, one of the things that has struck me for years is that I actually think reporters of decisions are very conscientious, very good people at, at doing this stuff in print. And I think, frankly, that if they knew how badly they suck when it comes to the electronic world, uh, that, that there would be some kind of collective professional suicide, right? <laughs> this, uh, because they really don't know. I mean, in a lot of cases, they've advocated responsibility of this stuff off to IT people and so forth and so on, and they just don't know. It, you know, it shouldn't be as hard to write scrapers as it is, and it wouldn't be if reporters of decisions were doing in digits what they've been doing in print for many, many years. Uh, very, very successfully. And, and so to an extent, this is always an education. Yeah, no, no, this is now principle number five of the non-tech. Uh, uh, education and training is, is a key part of, of making this happen. Yeah, um, exactly. Education, training, reference, implementations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This horse dead yet? Uh, not yet. Okay. Although I'm not sure what my question is, but um, uh, because it's written in the third person, should it's in the Whatever the shift tense is, um, is law.gov taking some responsibility for putting together these standards or coordinating the standards, or are you just saying someone needs to do this? In the report, I will summarize the Cornell workshop, which identified a series of existing standards and methodologies and use cases. Um, but I think what we're saying is government needs to take responsibility and it needs to work with places like LII and, and AAAL and others, and there are some existing ones, such as, as vendor neutral citation, that could be applied very quickly. Um, but no, we, we are not um, being specific in any of that stuff. Even on issues like standardization should happen, I think we need to say there are options. There are places like the Administrative Conference of the US. Um, but again, this is government should take control of, of their destiny. Uh, I think is the right approach here. Yeah, this is a, this is a genuinely difficult problem. In fact, uh, <coughs> when we were working on the ABA committee report on, on, on the rulemaking stuff, uh, about two thirds of the discussion, the committee discussion, actually had to do with who's going to make this happen within government, because there were a number of candidates. They were each of them plausible in a, in, in a slightly different way. Uh, and, and it really is a big question. If you have an existing standard out there, like the ABA citation standard, like the URN Lex thing that's coming out of uh, out of Italy for, for document identifiers, like some of the metadata work that's been out there, who locks that into government? How does, how, how does, how does that happen? Uh, it probably doesn't walk in without modification, but 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 but, but who does that? And, and that's not clear. That's not clear. Uh, nor nor can we clarify it here. Yeah. Any more on this horse? Yes. I'm sorry, I can relate, but um, what what's happening with like interactions between other LII institutes and governments of their jurisdictions? Is there any lessons to be drawn from those? Uh, good question. Like Osley or Ballard yes. or Canley. Yes and no. Uh, probably the cleanest example is Canley because their relationship with government, I think, has probably been the most productive of any of them. Um, 
the majority, in my view, I mean, there's been some excellent work done. It's mostly been done because it's been taking place in areas where jurisdiction is much less complex. Mm -hmm. uh, there are not nearly as many actors to deal with. They all know each other. Not 50 uh, states. Not 51, not, not, 51 juris, not 51 major jurisdictions. Uh, not a large population. Not separation of powers. Not decentralized approaches to a lot of stuff. And Australia is a very small place. It, so that's an that important it. aspect to bring out, but I'm not sure that's relevant to this yeah, criteria sorry. here. But it, it's definitely um, an important thing to look at what's going on. There, it is relevant in the sense of there are a series of international efforts and standardization efforts that we should be drawing upon. And interoperability on an international level is certainly one of several goals, but a goal that, that I think we should be striving towards. Um, particularly at the level of like national legislation and, and regulation, if, if something exists and Action. definitely ought to use it. Or document IDs, for example, it'd be real nice to have the US namespace interoperable with other namespaces that are there. And that should probably actually go in your call out of, of research projects. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's, 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 a, there's a zillion of those. Yeah, and there's a huge pile of notes from the Cornell two-day um, workshop on, on tech standards and a whole bunch of references. And, I'm hoping I can find in my pile of, of materials that's been saved. So. <laughs> I like that from just now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> More on this? Okay. I'm pressing the button. Neutral citation. This this should be eminently non-controversial, right? <laughs> right? Paragraph numbers. I mean, it's just so simple. <laughs> well. <laughs> This actually kind of goes back to a gloss I'd like to see on the standards thing. Yeah. Uh, a little bit. I, I've always had a little bit of an issue with the fact that double A, double L stops short of defining what a paragraph is. Right. Uh, because what they did was take something that ought to have been a simple computational exercise of detecting two sequential hard returns uh, and turn it into a fifth generation AI project. Yeah, Tom and I have talked about this. We, we have tried to do vendor-neutral citation, and for example, I've got the circuit court opinions. Um, I can't do it from the outside. If the court were to number the paragraphs, then it's easy. I just take their numbers. But if, if I number them and Tom numbers them, we're going to come up with different numbers. Yeah, yeah it's, it's actually, it's, actually it, it's always very tempting, when, when, uh, particularly for some reason when there are lawyers in the room. Uh, for, for semantics to creep into this in, in, in ways that they really should not. And I understand that. I, mean, I understand wanting the sort of head compatibility of it and wanting a, a sort of accurate representation of what the document is. And that would lead you to consider questions like, well, does this hanging quote really count as a paragraph? <coughs> you, know, you, would, you would want to look at stuff like that. But the fact of the matter is that, is that for, again, for reasons of cost and, and, and applicability, you, you really don't want to do that. You know, you really want to make it as mechanical as you possibly can because it, it just makes life easier in the long run. So maybe the FAQ on that one is, is a very polite statement saying the AA, double L, and ABA standards are, of course, the starting point and, however, should reflect current implementation experience of those standards from jurisdictions such as Oklahoma. I was pleased to see your use of the phrase consistent with. Yeah. <laughs> Are you asking the working groups to go back to double A, double L? I mean, maybe at this point you want you know, us to go back, or is that opening up a can of worms? You know, the issue now back? is just getting the jurisdictions to want to do it. And um, I mean, that's but step your idea one. Of one numbering source does make some sense. I mean, the concept is right, but the implementation. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that the AALL um, initiative is just to get the people who adopted them. Standards were written a long time ago, yeah. and it's just they're trying to get, uh, they started, I think started last year or the year before, they went back, when they combined the old Access to Electronic Legal Information Committee and the Citation Standards Committee, the, the push was to get people to adopt. I'd love to see a two-page gloss come out that says, let me tell you why AALL isn't able to be implemented, and gee, we think somebody ought to reopen that and, and you know define what a paragraph is. Um, but I don't think at the level of... I'm not trying to stall it. It's just something else that we would work on it. Yeah. 
I, I actually, my, my, my feeling about this is right. Every principal 100 blog posts. Uh, yeah. if, you, if, if people want to, if people want to write glosses on this, then by all means they should, and it would certainly be far more interesting than reading about the reference desk. See, the best thing I'd want is like the reporter of Oklahoma to blog and say, "We love double A double L, but we had problems figuring out what a paragraph was, and we think you know, body X, like the National Center for the Courts, ought to like to find a paragraph for double A double L." Does it does it actually matter? I mean, as long as you're doing it prospectively. Whatever they do is what it is. If the source is doing it, it's easy because then you just do whatever yeah. they did, right? Um, right. But the problem is you. you They're not. If it's all the problem is is, is how to do the archives, right? Uh, and so you publish your archive and you didn't bother going through a number of paragraphs. And both of us are mirroring your archive when we want to number those those paragraphs. Um, one of my offers to the Ninth Circuit will be potentially the the ability of handing them a copy of their archive back that, that has paragraph numbers in it. But, well. well, except for it makes like two different worlds, but what's the problem with just, just using the old star paging that they used to use in print-to-print -print translations in taking prints of electronic of old things? Uh, well, there's, there's actually the fundamental problem that a citation is a page-based citation is not a document address. Yeah. If you think about uh, the problem, for example, of multiple multiple opinions per page table cases, that kind of stuff, it's not wholly satisfactory no, as, as a unique document. Uh, but again, you, know, no. I, you, you, you can you can reasonable people can disagree about how big a problem that is, just as reasonable people can disagree about how likely it is that there will ever be malicious alteration of an online legal document. But, you know, nevertheless, there it is. Yeah, I mean, going forward is really the important thing. I mean, there's two things. Is, is the opinions going forward and maybe a reasonable archive probably ought to be numbered, and that's just the start, because even if you got paragraph numbers, you still need the local rules that say, and you are allowed to, in your brief, Cite my opinions using paragraph numbers and document numbers, and that you know that's we'll see. Um, take a while to get there. You know, having the courts originate the final version of their their opinions is a good start. Um, it makes it a little easier. And many courts that do that do allow you to cite by docket number instead of federal um, reporter citation. So it's a start. Yeah, I mean, once once the experience with self-publication grows, there's a lot of this stuff. It's almost inevitably. Sort itself out. Yeah. Well, but docket numbers aren't necessarily case identifiers. Yeah, understood. But, but it's I mean, like the Ohio system where they have a they yeah. assign the, the number. To the but case. but uh, Peter Martin has documented cases of, of, of states taking control of their archive and then numbering the paragraphs and then allowing you know vendor neutral citation to occur. And so that's a path. And I think that's an area where pointing to the ABA and the double A double L is is probably the safest thing to do. Um, and it's nice to depend on that existing consensus and authority that's out there for something somewhat radical, which this is. Um. <laughs> I had a bunch of um, Egyptian programming interns a year ago to whom I was trying to explain the problem of unique identifiers for Supreme Court. Uh, and trying to deal with the complexities of the identifier system along with the system of government is completely unfamiliar. <laughs> was far more than I could. Uh, and of the two, they understood the system of government much more quickly.